Hello, welcome to B2B Revenue Leaders. I'm your host, Dustin Tizik. Today, I'm joined by Garrett Marigut, who is the president and CEO over at Directive Consulting. And we're hitting on all things performance marketing this episode. So everything from their customer generation methodology to how to make gift card campaigns work, a bit about how thought leadership and events fits into their strategy, and probably most importantly, why knowing your TAM and actually having a solid list of customers that you want is really the key to B2B marketing. Hey, Garrett, welcome to the show. Hey, Dustin. Glad to be here, man. Excited to chat. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this. We're going to talk through a whole bunch of things around performance marketing, peel back a bit what you all are doing at Directive that's been working really well. But before that, to kind of set the stage, you go to the Directive website, you hear you talk, you hear about customer generation and that whole philosophy. So let's unpack that. Like, what does that actually mean to you? So our listeners have the context. Yeah, I mean, I think what's interesting about us and hopefully interesting about what we do is all the services we sell to other people, we do for ourselves. And so I've found that everybody, there's a lot of ideas that we all regurgitate that are frankly best practices that someone else has done for someone else. But very few professional marketers have actually applied their own ideas to their own businesses with their own capital. And I think when you start to actually apply your beliefs and your theories and your hypotheses and your own tactics and strategies to yourself, you start to see what works and what doesn't work a heck of a lot better than maybe the rest of your peers or your competitors or the industry. And so customer generation is just a byproduct of the fact that I've always tried to be the best in the world at whatever I'm selling for myself. So when we started as an SEO shop, I ranked us globally for SEO agency. We were number one. That's how I grew the business. We were an SEO business. I wrote and guest posted almost daily and I ranked us and I drove value and I created my own pipeline from my service. When we added paid media, we've always advertised. And in that pursuit, I realized that there was this kind of problem in advertising, especially for B2B organizations, since I'm a B2B organization. And that's search has this like in market intent, but like Google ads and SEO and a lot of the search channels can struggle when we start to niche or move up market or create parameters of who we can service and why and what industries are in because people don't search like that. They don't search enterprise B2B SaaS paid media agency. They kind of just search like paid media agency. And they're like, oh, they do SaaS. That's cool. Like, but then that creates yeah. a lot of waste for the ones that don't, right? And on the other hand, you got social where everybody's running ebooks and guides and data sheets and white papers to lead gen forms, sending them to SDRs and then saying the channel's too expensive doesn't work because there's no intent. And so customer generation is just a byproduct of me spending two to $3 million a year on my own ads and trying to figure out how to drive bookings from it. And that pursuit of trying to be great at my craft and good at the thing I sell and wanting to be honoring my clients, that's kind of how customer generation came to be. Nice. Yeah. So there's a big part there of just putting your money where your mouth is, right? Like you're spending your money that you all earn to test it out. And I think the key thing, like the downfall to me with Google ads sometimes, and with that old school of ebook play, you just, you drive a lot of leads, don't drive a lot of customers. And we run into that too. Like we're not the cheapest video service. So some of our Google leads come in and they're like, I only want to pay $500. We're not the right fit. And I know you all have the same thing. You're like, so wants to spend yeah. a grand a month. You aren't the right fit. So I like the idea of picking the customers you want and going to get them and not just yeah. driving leads, which just makes everyone angry at you on the sales team anyways. Yeah. I mean, with the customer generation methodology, we're just looking at our clients, best customers. Yeah. Enriching them in like a zoom info. So we can see their technographic traits, their firmographic traits, what makes them a great customer of Testimonial Hero, right? And then once we've identified, okay, they're a great customer of Testimonial Hero, if we can scrape the Wissia script from the site, if they're already leveraging Vidyard, that shows that they've made a capital investment into the video channel. Okay, yeah. cool. That's a great step. Then we have a tier two for people using Vimeo and YouTube because maybe they have video, but they haven't necessarily invested in a tech ecosystem to get leverage off of it. All right. right. Now I can see, okay, this is what someone could be good. I start looking at your clients. I start understanding, okay, how many 
organizations have Wissy or Vidyard in the US that also have 100 employees. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right, now I build out that list. I manually verify it. That's a critical step in the process. And then I'm going to launch ads and I'm going to try to delete informational intent advertising. So like lead gen from my capital. I'm going to run video at the top of my funnel and leverage CPM-based bidding. You know, humans don't leave the platforms anymore. Like yeah. think about it for yourself. When was the last time you were on Instagram and left Instagram? Never, basically. Right? What's when was the last there? time you were on YouTube? Left YouTube. When was the last time you were on LinkedIn yeah. and left LinkedIn? We consume the information in the feed. And that's the beauty of video these days. It plays in the feed and it creates this moment where your brand can be consumed and understood and hopefully desired. Mm -hmm. And then you hit them with gift cards and other direct response offers at the bottom of the funnel to try to drive them directly to a sales moment. And then you use customer testimonials in between in like the middle, but once again, it's video based and you're not having these high CPLs. You're instead just driving people directly to demo and then nurturing them with video throughout. Yeah, that's exactly our playbook. And we borrowed parts of it, big parts of it from actually what you guys are doing over there. Because what we yeah. were missing is we we're doing a great job of showing video, getting people interested. They know who we are, but we didn't have that direct response. That capture moment, yeah. Yeah, which is difficult, right? Because Google, it's easy. You run the ad to the right keyword with the right phrasing, the right landing page. Yeah. You capture them because they're in market. So one interesting thing you mentioned there is like running the gift card play, which something we do, something you do a lot. The sales process there is a little bit different, right? Like it's not the same as a Google lead. So I'm curious how, how you think through that and can make sure you're actually getting the right value out of those leads and converting them at a reasonable rate. Yeah. Somehow I've become like the godfather of gift cards, it appears. <laughs> Apparently, and yeah. Yeah, they work, you know, and I've worked with Sam for probably almost three years now. So they work. They just do. They're very successful. And they, they work for a simple reason. You know, humans are in an apathetic state on paid social. So when they're on yeah. the Facebook or Instagram or on LinkedIn or X or anything like that, they're not expressing in market intent. And the third-party data providers like the Bomboros and things like that who provide intent data. I'm not a huge fan of, I, I don't think yeah. they're great. And so what I focus on is creating intent and I leverage a financial incentive to create that intent to get someone to a sales moment. Now, in that sales moment, there's some learnings that help you monetize gift cards. So if you use SDRs for intro calls, you have to have a deck. You got to do a deck, so you standardize whatever. What you'll find is some SDRs will have really good intro held, the strategy goal held or discovery call or pitch conversion rates and some won't. And then when you roll out the deck, you'll normalize that, that gap between the high performers and the bottom performers. I'll get you kind of all the bottoms to the middle and the top will still be the top. You'll kind of smooth out that curve. And then if you use AEs, you got to teach them to be really direct. And then I like to ask this psychological question which helps create a framing. So it says, you know, hey, Dustin, you know, so I'm glad to chat with you. I was checking out your website. Super exciting. It looks like an amazing opportunity. I also saw that you came from a gift card campaign. You're obviously super successful and you don't need a hundred bucks. So well, why do you think this would be such a top priority for you with everything you have in your life? And now you either have to admit that you're a butthead and you're taking my money <laughs> with no intent, or yeah. you have to tell me, and you tell me that, or... You tell me that the truth of like what your real opportunity is, and then I can essentially prioritize you or do prioritize you from a follow-up and a next step standpoint in that moment. So I just think it's really, really critical. You train those AEs and those SDRs on how to have direct, honest conversations to filter through. My data has told me and shown me it's about six to seven out of 10 are legit, like three to four out of 10 just want the gift card. But even with the three to four waste, you have still an exponentially lower intro call held rate than not doing it and it unlocks LinkedIn. And if you're a B2B organization, where else are you going to spend your money? What, there's also a magical yeah. fit channel where we're going to start like airdropping, you know, direct mail on people's houses. Like, what are you going to do? You know what I mean? You're going to go fly out to their house. There's no in office. So you lost that tactic. You going to send mail. All right. Well, good luck trying to match people on white pages to their accounts. You're going to advertise on Google. How? You don't know what industry they're in. You don't know what their AOV is going to be. 
You don't know if they're the right person, especially if you niche, you strengthen your positioning. Like there's a lot of problems right now. So if you, if you can't get people from LinkedIn to a demo, it's going to be hard to grow from an advertising perspective. Yeah. It's like fish where the fish are basically, right? Like the, everyone is on LinkedIn. You can get the targeting. One thing I, I want to mention real quick that I know is important to what you guys do. And you did mention it here, but I think it's important for others to really catch on is the list is a big part of this, right? LinkedIn yeah. native targeting can be iffy, I think yeah. at best, depending. Yeah. Um, so how important is that? Like actually ma manually verifying, taking the time to do that upfront work to get the list? Critically, I mean, remember I'm spending two or $3 million of my own money. So my methodology yeah. is based on thoroughness and honoring the budget because it's legitimately my money. I mean, we're bootstrapped. This ain't nobody else's money. Yeah. So my point being is like, yeah, little things matter. I mean, that's why most people are bad at marketing is they kind of skip steps and they're not thorough. Most marketers, myself included at times, have a tendency to prioritize the breadth of our activities instead of the depth of our strategies. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the fundamental problem. Yeah, and I think, so this is kind of dipping our toe in that a little bit on the breadth side. So like we talked about, you know, straight up performance marketing and hitting them with video and everything. The flip side, which I know you guys do as much, and it leads into this campaign is the personal brand, you know, thought leadership event side. So I'm curious how you, like how you think the, of having those two interact and maybe how important that thought leadership and, you know, brand building side is in your strategy. Well, I'll start with the TAM, right? So. You know, we build that total addressable market. It's like ABM on steroids, right? I find yeah. every client, like I have every B2B software company in the US in my database and in my ad platforms bi-directionally say. And then I can look in Salesforce at how much market share I've taken against named accounts. So I'm pixel proofing the customer generation methodology. I don't need anything else. I can upload the data into Salesforce. I can advertise the data on paid social and programmatic. And then I can reconcile if those accounts enter my pipeline, if they're closed one, closed loss, et cetera. And so that's marketing. I don't, yeah, sure. Channels are the else I dive into. I'm doing LTV CAC by channel and I'm looking at lifecycle yeah. stage performance by channel, AOV by channel, close rate by channel. But at the high level, I can see my go-to-market strategy and how much market share I'm taking. That's really important as a professional marketer when it comes to building trust when it comes to expanding budget, when it comes to expanding the scope of your authority and your role, if you're in house. But I, to answer your specific question, if I have a TAM, all I care about is being creative and getting like, what I say is like shockingly memorable. I want to create shockingly memorable experiences for them. And I want to evoke the emotion of jealousy and confidence. I want them to be jealous of my marketing. I want them to want it for themselves. And then I want them to have confidence that I'm not like the other agencies. And then I want to, you know, for the last five, six years, I've been hitting that same every B2B SaaS account, director of demand gen, VP, CMO with my ads. They know who I am, but they haven't created a human connection. So this year is about meeting them in person and putting a face to the name and to the brand to show like, yeah, we work with the two biggest players in your space. We are the market leader and we are real. This is our team. This is our methodology. We'd love to have a call with you. And it's really to kind of activate those people that haven't digitally been activated over the years and create another way of interacting with that team. Yeah, I think, like, like you said, trust there is the key thing, right? Because most, any marketer who's been doing marketing for a while, it's probably hired an agency at some point and got burnt. Honestly, like, yeah. it's just the reality of it. Like, you probably yeah, you hired a lot of ex girlfriend syndrome over here. We do. There's, there's some, some drama, some trauma there floating around, right? So I think... Yep. That, that's interesting doing the in-person event thing. So I want to kind of double click on that a little yeah. bit. You mentioned meeting them in person. Are you doing this like, like a roadshow type style? Are you picking, you know, specific accounts to go out to? Curious how you're thinking through those in-person events and that, yeah. like, CEO. I'm not that good at it. I mean, so I wouldn't say like, I'm some like expert. I'm just trying really hard. Uh, that's usually how it goes with me in life is I'm not usually that good at anything. I just try really hard and eventually get better at it. Yeah. So right now I'm trying to learn events. You know, it's not my background. It's not something I'm better than everybody at or anything like that. But anytime I do something, I try to establish principles and then 
debrief after each time to validate if my principles are still accurate and, and have some fundamental hypotheses of what I believe will work, why I believe it will work, and then how I will evaluate if it's working or not. And so it'll be very structured in how I approach new initiatives. Usually gets me to the point where I am good at it and I am successful at it. So I set aside, I think, a quarter million dollars this year for events to try to learn it. I mapped out every B2B SaaS event in the markets that I operate in. I think I have 15 and I'm going to try to go to all 15 and just kill myself essentially on the road of just working my butt off. My playbook is try to speak. I am a good speaker. I do keynote events. Uh, I get, I love to be on the stage. I bring a lot of passion, energy, insights. I get great speakers for us. So it's a strength of mine. So I want to leverage that strength. I do think I do better content than my competitors. I think that I can stand out. So it's like, okay. And I'm a thought, I, I sell consulting. So them wanting my ideas is a critical component uh, of our larger average overvalue in our success. So I want them to want my methodology, not just want my services. And so speaking is a good way for me to do that. So I start there. So I try to anchor every event around speaking, ideally. And if I can't pitch to get it speaking, then I can see how much it costs to pay to speak. And then that's where most of my budget's going to go. I don't want the booths. I, I'm not a huge fan of the booths. I also don't like booths because they, they absorb some of my event capacity. In other words, I need someone to staff the booth. Yeah. Like someone has to be at the booth. So multiple people, frankly, have to be at the booth. So let's say you go to like, we just went to B2B marketing exchange in Scottsdale uh, last week. And I got back two days ago from PubCon in Vegas where I spoke. So I've been going almost weekly, but the last one we brought uh, four guys. So four AEs or three AEs and myself, and we just made some couple rules and I thought the event went well. I spoke, they did the best job they could hovering around the tables while I spoke. And in between the break we took to get information and talk. We got some people from that to actually fill out our form after. So that was cool. And then we all got on the app and we set meetings. So we just went alphabetically by like A to F, you get this, F to this, you get that. Broke out the people, try to set as many. I set a five meeting for a goal. I also then brought a client salesperson. I had them cross-reference the attendee list or the account list to see who are current clients that they could meet with because their job is cross-sells and upsells while the other AEs are new business. Um, and then stay in the sessions. Nobody's allowed to sit together in the networking. No one's allowed to be together and you just spread out and try to create a network effect where everyone has had a conversation with someone from directed. And that was our playbook essentially. Nice. So I want to get in how you measure it. Cause part of it for sure is going to be the meetings book, but there's yeah. also, there's a different kind of longer term play here as well, which is difficult to measure. But the one thing I want to mention first is the not getting the booth, which is interesting because if you did have to get a booth at all of these events, you would blow through your, you know, 250 K budget in about five events. Probably yeah, as well, I mean, right? the booths right now are anywhere between 10 to 30 K. It's kind yep. of like booth costs. And then, you know, travel cost is about a thousand dollars a head, give or take. So you kind of go from there to a certain extent, you know, I think the key to all this stuff is you have to have really strong financial modeling. So I know that I can spend $22,000 to acquire a customer. So what yep. I do is I set a $17,000 budget for the event, and then I'll try to bring four to five people and that creates the flex. And then ideally I want to do co-marketing or have my own private dinner or something like that. But we're still a really small team. I have no one in charge of events. It's literally just me right now. My director of marketing doesn't start till Monday. So I can only do so much as like with my bandwidth and everything else and the volume of events. So I'm trying to keep it simple, stupid, you know, like when there's the networking moments, flood the floor, do the best you can to have conversations. And when it comes to measurement, don't overthink it. Just spend as little as you can to be at the events. Like, you know, I don't want to spend more than 22,000 because if I do, I'll need the event to do something. It probably can't, you know what I mean? Like now I need three customers. It's like, I'm not getting three customers. Now the event didn't work, but that's not fair to marketing. Right. And so I'm really just trying to measure market share. Like we talked about earlier on my TAM and see, cause that's, if you get honest about it, you strip away all this channel level. And like, what did the event do for me? It's like, well, that's regardless. How much market share did we take with the capital we deployed? 
And are we going to continue in 2025 to deploy to events or deploy it anywhere different? It's like, well, let's look and see if we can do some incrementality, maybe year over year. Maybe we can see if form fills go up during like event times, during days that we speak. There's ways to try to get directional things, but you just got to trust your guys that they're not there to waste their time. They've got clear direction and then have as many good conversations as you can. Have the guys put in like I interviewed someone the other day, actually, the gal who runs events for Six Sense. because I was trying to sponsor something with them and I'm like trying to learn, you know, so I was like, hey, you know, her name's Bethany, Bethany. How do you, how do you approach events? How do you evaluate mm-hmm. if events are successful? And she had qualified conversations as a KPI, which is something yeah. that I'm yeah. trying to track. And then and when they do have a qualified conversation, she makes them fill out a form. I'm going to make my guys do that too. Little thing on the, like a, on your phone where you could just like put in a couple details, name, account, LinkedIn, put it in and then see how many qualified conversations we're able to have. I think it was a brilliant way of measuring it. And then you can. Upload that as a campaign to Salesforce, cross for it, add it as a touch point, and then cross reference to see in your TAM how many of those touch points created opportunities within, you know, 12 months, six months, whatever that is. So I think there's some great ways to do it. I just got to keep learning, you know? Yeah. My background is not in events at all, but we're thinking of doing, doing a couple this year and kind of dipping our toes. Yeah. So that's actually useful because I've been at companies where they measure events. How many customers did we get three months out from this event? The answer is probably going to be zero. Kind yeah. of. A, not the smartest way to measure it. So yeah, you're right. You don't know if that would work. Go on, I mean, we're I almost doing info engagement on a speaking gig and it didn't come through for like 18 months. But yeah, you know, like I got people thought my form where they heard me speak six years ago in Denver. You know, it's like that that happens all the time. So I just got to, once again, anything that's hard, hard to attribute, I spend as little as I can on it to never stop spending on it if I know if it's good. Same thing with brand. Like I spend as little as possible on brand advertising to never stop doing brand advertising. Yeah, exactly. We had a similar thing. Like I spoke last year at a demand, like the metadata conference. Yep. And we don't have a lot of direct attribution, but I will hear someone on a sales call be like, oh, I heard Dustin speak at that right. event, looked you guys up, right? Like, we'll just say that we hey, I saw a post from Garrett or from this guy or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So cool. I think lots of lessons here. Some we've already taken from you guys, some we might take and try yep. out. So I know you talk about this, a bunch of other topics on LinkedIn, through courses. So if our listeners want to connect, learn more, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, I mean, so Directive does advertising and marketing for B2B SaaS organizations. We've launched a startup package now as well. So, you know, we got the blessing to work with AWS, Uber, Snapchat, Gong. Like we get to work with the biggest, best brains in the world now, which is really special. And I feel honored to do it every day. But now I can serve the people who want to be Gong that want to be AWS, yep. that want to be the next thing. So we have really approachable price in there. It's fifty-seven fifty, so $5,750 a month, month to month terms. You get paid media, SEO, design, marketing ops, support. You get a lot. It's really cool mm-hmm. offering. We launched that in November. We're up to almost 30 customers now. No one's actually fully churned yet, which is insane. Um, so been really, really special and great to see. We're in about 4.3 out of five on our customer satisfaction scores. We've ran nine surveys to those, like, you know, almost 30 accounts, like the response we've gotten, you know, so it's Mm -hmm. been really cool. And then, you know, if you're an agency owner, I do coaching as well and have the blessing to coach probably a lot of your favorite agency leaders. So yeah, always down to chat and learn more. Uh, Like me on LinkedIn, Twitter, shoot me an email. I'm pretty responsive. Cool. So yeah, well, for listeners, we'll include those links. Garrett, thanks for joining me. Really appreciate it. It was fun. Thanks for having me, Dustin. Thanks for listening to this episode. My key takeaway on this one is just how important it is to have that perfect list of companies in your TAM. So it lets you set a target to stay in front of these people constantly and also gives you a rough way to measure the impact of your other marketing efforts because you can look further out and see how many of these ideal customers you're actually bringing in. Also, I mean, niching down is so important right now for most companies to succeed. So you got to figure out who you're for, build trust with them and have a compelling offer. Sounds simple, right? But it's not easy. But that's my key takeaway from this one. If you enjoyed this episode, show us some love with a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Always really appreciate that. And as always, I'll be back next Tuesday with a new episode.